My name's Kellen. And yeah, I guess you could call me an outdoorsy type. Hiking, camping, fishing, all my favorite ways to blow off steam after a long week at the office. This past weekend, I had my sights set on Yellowstone National Park. Always figured it was about time I explored America's first natural wonderland. I decided on a solo, four-day hike covering some of the park's backcountry trails. I'd researched, prepped, packed, all the usual safety stuff. I wasn't one of those chuckleheads on the evening news that needed rescuing because they thought they could tackle Everest in flip-flops. Day one was a dream. I set off from a trailhead near Canyon Village, the sun high, birds chirping. That fresh pine scent in the air that makes you feel like you can take on the world. The hike was tough at certain points, but nothing I couldn't handle. That first night, though, things started getting weird. I was alone out there. Hadn't seen another soul for hours. But at dinner, I got the distinct impression I wasn't exactly by myself. Now, before you start thinking I've lost my marbles, hear me out. It was just the usual rustlings of leaves, the odd branch snapping, the kind of thing you expect. But I swore I heard footsteps, heavy, deliberate steps, like something big was pacing around the edge of my campsite. I even caught a whiff of something musky, something I couldn't quite place. It set me on edge. I figured I was just being paranoid, right? I chalked it up to an overactive imagination fueled by too many creepy campfire stories heard as a kid. But still, sleep didn't come easy. I kept seeing movement out of the corner of my eye, shadows flitting between the trees. Day two started with a jolt. When I woke up, there were massive prints in the soft dirt surrounding my tent. Huge. Too big to belong to any animal I knew of in those woods. Black bear, maybe? But something about the shape, the way the toe claws were defined, it didn't fit. I told myself to calm down. Had to be a hoax, someone playing a prank on an out-of-towner. It was ridiculous, but I even questioned if my own boot prints had somehow morphed overnight. But deep down, I knew something was off. Should have bailed right then, but the stubborn side of me wouldn't let it go. Those weird tracks ignited something in me. A morbid sort of curiosity. Besides, I had three days of rations, a sturdy tent, and a good hunting knife just in case. I convinced myself I could handle it, whatever it was. And that's where things went downhill. Each day, those noises, those prints, they got closer. Always just outside my field of vision. Always right on the edge of what I could definitively explain away. On day three, it got worse. I was climbing this ridge for a killer view, had just reached the top when I spotted it. A figure hunched over on the next hill over, silhouetted against the afternoon light. It was too far for details, but I could tell this thing was massive, like seven feet tall, easy, built like a linebacker. It moved with this lumbering, unnatural grace. Then it whipped its head around, straight at me, as if it knew I was there. I froze. For a heartbeat, its eyes locked with mine, and a chill ran down my spine. Those weren't animal eyes. There was intelligence there. Something calculated, almost predatory. That's when I bolted. I didn't look back until I was clear down the mountainside, my chest heaving, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. That night, I didn't bother with cooking. I just stuffed some energy bars in my mouth and burrowed deep into my sleeping bag, the icy tendrils of fear clinging to me tighter than the damp night air. And yeah, I know the smart thing, the logical thing, would have been packing up my things in the morning and getting the hell out of Yellowstone. But there was another part of me, the reckless part, the idiot part, whatever you want to call it, that burned with the need to know what the hell I was dealing with. A part of me figured I had two choices, run and and never know what lurked in the shadows of those woods, or face it head on. So, I stayed. I laid a trap, a simple one, really. I set up my motion-activated trail camera on a tree near my camp, 
loaded it with a fresh memory card, and hoped to catch at least a glimpse of whatever had been shadowing my every move. That night, huddled in my tent, I heard the telltale thud of the camera going off. My pulse quickened. But as exhausted as I was, as much as my brain screamed for sleep, I forced myself to stay awake. I spent the next hours straining my ears, my mind racing through every worst-case scenario, until I heard it. A guttural growl, low and menacing, echoing through the trees. Then came the sound of snapping branches, getting closer, faster. Whatever it was, it was heading straight for me. I fumbled for my knife, my flashlight, my body trembling like a cornered animal. And that's when I saw its shadow cast against the tent wall. It looked like a man, but the proportions were all wrong. The limbs were too long, the torso too hunched, the head too large and bulbous to belong to any human. It circled the tent, snarling, its breath steaming in the frigid air. My fingers tightened around the knife, a futile weapon against something so monstrous. A sharp, ripping sound tore through the silence, like claws raking against nylon. My heart pounded in my throat as I realized the creature was trying to shred its way into my tent. Desperation surged through me. I knew I could either cower in terror or go down fighting. Clutching my flashlight, I lunged forward, tearing open the tent flap. The creature recoiled, momentarily startled by the burst of light. I shined the beam directly at its face, and I'll never forget what I saw. Its skin was mottled gray, stretched tight over bulging muscles. The eyes were black pits, devoid of any warmth or humanity. Its teeth were bared in a snarl, elongated canines dripping with saliva. I screamed, a raw, primal yell meant to shock and intimidate. The creature hesitated, a flicker of something like confusion passing through its monstrous features. And that hesitation was all I needed. I broke into a dead sprint, the flashlight bouncing wildly in my hand. It roared in fury behind me, its massive form crashing through the underbrush. I ran like I'd never run before, fueled by pure terror. I barely heard anything over the frantic beating of my heart and the ragged gasps escaping my lungs. Luck, or some stroke of survival instinct, guided my feet. The terrain was rough, the trail obscured by darkness, but somehow I didn't stumble. I didn't fall. Then, a glimmer of hope. The trailhead. I could see the faint outline of my car. I dug deep, finding a last burst of energy to propel myself forward. I fumbled for my keys, my hands shaking so badly I could barely get them in the lock. The car door swung open and I scrambled inside, slamming it shut and locking it just as the creature broke through the tree line. It pounded against the windows, its snarls echoing through the night. I started the engine, the headlights slicing through the darkness and illuminating the beast for a horrifying second. Then I threw the car into reverse and floored it, swerving wildly as I fled the campsite. I drove for what felt like forever, my mind a chaotic mess of adrenaline and disbelief. I stopped only once pulling into a deserted gas station to splash water on my face and try to regain some semblance of composure. I didn't call the cops. Didn't call anyone. Who would believe me? By sunrise, I'd reached the park boundary in relative civilization. Exhausted and shaken, I pulled over to the side of the road and just sat there, staring blankly at the passing cars. The aftermath? Well, that's where things get complicated. I went home, of course, tried to carry on with my life. But you can't see something like that and just forget it. It changes you. I had nightmares for months, always jolting awake with the sound of its snarls ringing in my ears. A therapist suggested I try writing my account of everything that happened to try and make sense of it, and that's when I found them. The old forum posts, the whispers online about other disappearances in the park, other people who claimed to have seen something. Unnatural. It made me feel marginally less insane. I became obsessed, poring over old maps, researching local folklore. The creature I saw? Some people would call it a cryptid. A beast of legend. 
Others might call it a demon. Me, I don't know the name for it. What I do know is that it's out there, lurking on the fringes of Yellowstone. Some days, I want to round up a posse, gear up and go hunting for the damn thing, put an end to whatever else it might have planned. Then other days, the part of me that values a peaceful night's sleep wins out. Part of me wishes I'd never set foot in Yellowstone, never had my eyes open to the dark reality that hides just beyond the veil of the ordinary. I still love the outdoors, but it's different now. There's always this lingering fear, the knowledge that the world is wilder and far more dangerous than most people would ever dream. I check over my shoulder more often. I sleep with a hunting knife under my pillow. Maybe someday I'll get up the nerve to go back, to try and capture some proof, something solid enough to make the world believe what really lurks out there in the shadows. Or maybe I'll spend the rest of my life looking back, forever haunted by that glimpse into the darkness. Honestly, I'm not sure which ending is worse. The year was 2019, and I was finally exploring the Pacific Northwest on a solo, multi-week trek. Been wanting to do this since I first read Wild years ago. I've always loved it up here. Loved the rugged coastline and the vast, old-growth forests. Name's Rhett Hansen, by the way, and I've been a serious hiker for a long time. I started down in Oregon on the Pacific Crest Trail, and by the time I reached the Columbia River Gorge, I was feeling good, ready to go further north. I decided to spend a couple days exploring the Washington side of the gorge. It's one of those stunning river valleys, with thick forests and waterfalls cascading down sheer cliffs. I based myself out of a small town and decided to tackle one of the less frequented trails nearby. It promised waterfalls and views I knew I didn't want to miss. I set off early, excited to hit the trail after the past few days off. And it was even more beautiful than I'd imagined. Lush, vibrant greens everywhere, ferns as tall as trees, and the roar of waterfalls echoing all around. I took my time, stopping to admire the view at several overlooks and even treating myself to a leisurely lunch on a moss-covered boulder, just soaking in the tranquility of the place. I was having the perfect day out until around late afternoon when I came to a spot where the trail took a hard turn into a section of forest that looked much denser, almost primal. The sun barely penetrated the thick canopy overhead, and the air felt cooler and somehow heavier. It wasn't spooky per se, just different. Now, I'm not usually one for superstition but it was hard not to think of the old native legends about these forests being sacred, even guarded. Still, after a moment's hesitation, I decided to press on. The trail was clear, and I figured the density of the trees probably meant fewer crowds. As I went deeper, though, the silence became unsettling, not even a hint of birdsong or the chirp of insects. I started noticing strange things, trees that looked almost twisted, as if the branches were reaching out. A few times I thought I heard rustling in the foliage, but whenever I looked around, I saw nothing. I brushed it off as nerves and pushed onward, not wanting to turn back. After about half a mile, the trail led to a clearing, and in the center was a huge tree that dwarfed the others. It had a massive trunk and thick, exposed roots. I was admiring its age and power when I saw something carved into the bark right about eye level. It wasn't letters, but a symbol of some kind. I'd never seen anything like it, three short diagonal lines crossed by a circle. I reached out to touch it. That must have been a trigger of some sort because, just as my fingers grazed the wood, an ear-splitting shriek erupted from up in the branches high above. I jumped and jerked back my hand my heart pounding through my chest. I looked up, scanning for the source of the sound, but saw nothing. My whole body was on high alert. I scanned the forest around me. Then, something dropped down from a massive branch in front of me. It was a deer carcass, 
still steaming and bloody. The impact when it hit the ground made me wince. I stared up in bewildered terror, and this time, I saw it. A hulking shape perched on a high branch, blending perfectly with the shadows. At first, I couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. All I could process was that the form was huge and vaguely man-like, but covered in thick, dark fur. Powerful muscles rippled as it clung easily to the branch. It took a few seconds for my brain to catch up with my eyes. And then, it clicked. Bigfoot. My rational mind scoffed. Bigfoot wasn't real. And yet here it was, peering down at me with glowing, amber eyes. I froze in place. It was almost close enough to touch. The smell of it hit me, musky and putrid. It tilted its head, studying me, and I heard a wet, guttural growl come from its throat. Panic finally jolted me into motion. Without even thinking, I turned and ran, shoving past the carcass and blindly back down the trail. I ran without stopping, without looking back, just propelled by adrenaline and the primal instinct to survive. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs felt like jelly, and still I ran. Finally, exhausted, I tripped over a root and went sprawling on the trail. I gasped, trying to suck in lungfuls of air to continue, but before I could move, a huge clawed hand landed next to my head. I squeezed my eyes shut, certain my end was near. Instead of dragging me off, though, I heard a startled grunt, some crashing through the undergrowth, and then... silence. My eyes flew open. Nothing. Cautiously, I sat up. The sun was setting, casting long shadows. I didn't take a chance at seeing what was out there. I scrambled to my feet and ran until I burst out of the forest and back onto the well-traveled trail that led back toward the overlook. I never looked back. I kept moving, stumbling in the gathering darkness long after I'd reached the safety of the main trailhead. My heart pounded in my chest, and I don't think I took a normal breath the entire time I struggled back into town in the dead of night. I somehow convinced a kind hotel clerk to let me in, and I collapsed into the room, locking the door and shoving every chair in the place against it as barricades. I stayed locked in that hotel room for two days, only venturing out for necessities. My mind was on overdrive. There was my rational side, assuring me that I'd hallucinated. No such thing as Bigfoot, right? Too tired, weird lighting, imagination playing tricks. But then there was the other side, the side that remembered the glowing eyes, the rancid smell, the way it had toyed with me like a cat with a mouse. It was more than a bad dream. There was something real in those woods. On the third morning, I finally managed to shake myself out of my terror-induced paralysis. I booked a flight back home and was on a plane that afternoon. When I landed, I didn't even hesitate. I got a rental car and drove directly to my childhood home where my mom still lives. I was a grown man, but I needed her comfort, her reassurance that the world wasn't as scary as it now seemed. It was late when I pulled into the driveway. Mom came to the door, her eyes widening with shock and then concern as she took in my appearance. After the first hug and a mug of steaming tea, I spilled everything, holding nothing back. Mom listened patiently, without interrupting. When I was done, when the story was out there and I was shivering even in the warm kitchen, she got up and went into the living room. I followed her wondering what she was doing. She came back with an old, worn photo album. She flipped to a faded black and white photo, a group of people smiling around a campfire in some forest. Grandpa and Grandma's backpacking trip with their hiking club, she said, late sixties, somewhere in northern Washington. There, pointing at a couple standing at the edge of the photo, were my grandparents, looking much younger. Look at the tree she said softly, and my breath caught in my throat. Carved into the bark was the same three diagonal lines, crossed by a circle, the same symbol I'd seen days ago, hundreds of miles away in the Columbia River Gorge. A chill ran through my body that had nothing to do with the cool night air. 
My dad always said those weren't just any woods, she told me, that they were different. He never said much more about it, always just a bit of a warning. I stared at the photo, my mind trying and failing to process. Was this family lore? A coincidence? But then why had the creature come after me? Why the fresh kill? What if this wasn't a coincidence at all? In the days following, I did extensive research online. Bigfoot sightings in the Pacific Northwest. Native American legends about forest guardians. The more I searched, the more I saw patterns that chilled me. Strange carcasses. Disappearances. Sightings just like mine. There was no concrete evidence for what was out there. But it was hard to believe that these were all mere hallucinations or misidentification. I never went back to Washington. That trip soured the Pacific Northwest for me for good. I don't tell many people about it. Most think I'm crazy or pulling their leg. Mom believed me, though. She saw the look in my eyes, that raw, visceral fear that couldn't be faked. And she knew the family stories. So we have a pact of silence on this one. I still hike, but now it's always on well-trodden paths with lots of fellow hikers around. The wild feels less inviting than it used to. Part of me wants to go back, find that clearing, get some proof to bring back. But the stronger part, the part that remembers the dripping carcass and those glowing eyes, that part wins. Because as much as I want proof that I'm not crazy, do I really want to know what else is out there? The year was 2019 and I, Wilder Hayes, was in desperate need of a break. After a rough divorce, I was feeling lost and untethered. A week-long solo backpacking trip through Olympic National Park, with its towering forests and rugged coastline, seemed like the perfect escape. My first few days were a balm to my wounded spirit. The fresh, pine-scented air felt like a tonic, and the miles melted away my troubles. But as I ventured deeper into the park's interior... I began to feel... off. It wasn't anything overt, just an unshakable sense that I was no longer truly alone. This sense of being watched came to a head on the morning of day five. At first, I thought it was a deer or an elk, but the movement was wrong, too deliberate. I froze mid-stride, my heart pounding. Then I saw it, peeking from behind a moss-covered boulder a single, pale, piercing eye the size of a golf ball. My first instinct was to dismiss it, to chalk it up to exhaustion. But some primal part of me knew that wasn't the case. For the rest of that day, I was constantly on edge. I heard whispers and shuffling footsteps just beyond my reach, catching flashes of something large and unnaturally white in my peripheral vision. It would disappear as soon as I turned to face it. When darkness fell, the sense of dread intensified. Sleep was impossible. I lay in my tent, eyes wide, scanning the darkness outside for any sign of the thing that stalked me. The breaking point came at dawn. Setting out on the trail, I noticed something lying under a large pine tree. Dread filled me as I approached it, a gutted deer carcass, its flesh still fresh. But worse than the sight itself was the message it implied. Whatever was out there saw me as prey. I abandoned my pack and half ran, half stumbled down the trail. My breath came in ragged gasps as I fled the unseen hunter. Panic propelled me forward, the trees a blur on either side of the path. I could still feel those eyes on me. Every crack of a twig, every rustle of leaves made me jump and sent a surge of terror through my veins. And then I saw it, the creature, in full for the first time. It was massive, standing almost eight feet tall on powerful hind legs. Its skin was a sickly, hairless white, stretched taut over bulging muscles. Its arms were disproportionately long, ending in thick, gnarled claws. But the most horrific detail was the head, twisted and elongated, with a mouth that split far too wide, filled with rows of jagged teeth. 
It let out a hissing, guttural sound that made my blood run cold. I didn't bother to think. I just reacted. Dropping onto my hands and knees, I scrambled underneath a tangle of rhododendron bushes, my heart pounding so hard I thought it would burst from my chest. Crouching in the concealment of thorny branches, I peered through the leaves, holding my breath. The creature stalked past my hiding place, sniffing the air, its hideous face a mask of predatory hunger. I didn't move a muscle, barely daring to breathe as it lingered just a few feet away. I could smell it, a stench like rotten meat and something acrid underneath. Mercifully, it didn't notice me, and after what felt like an eternity, it moved deeper into the tangled foliage. Once I was certain it was gone, I bolted. I ran until my legs burned and my lungs screamed for air. Only then did I dare to look back, half expecting to see the creature bounding out of the forest in pursuit. The trail was empty. Just beyond the next bend was a group of day hikers, families and friends out for a casual weekend outing. Stumbling toward them, I was a sight. Filthy, disheveled, eyes wild with terror. Struggling to catch my breath, I gasped out what I had seen while their faces contorted in disbelief. A few of the men walked a short way up the trail, scanning the woods, but of course, they found nothing. They came back with pitying looks, urging me to go with them and get help. I tried to explain, to make them understand, but the words felt hollow. It was easier, safer, to let them think I was some unhinged guy who had spent too long in the wilderness. To protect what was left of my sanity, I went with them. The rangers searched, but found nothing. They took my statement, their expressions a mix of concern and skepticism. Deep down, I knew they thought I'd cracked, that the stress and isolation had pushed me over the edge. And maybe they were right. I returned home, but I was irrevocably changed. The image of that grotesque creature is seared into my memory. I still avoid remote wilderness, unable to shake the fear that it, or something like it, still lurks in the shadows. Sometimes, in the dead of night, I wake to the sound of scratching on my window, and I know it's out there, waiting. The year was 1976, and I was headed for a long weekend in the wilds of Death Valley National Park. You might think I'm crazy, a solo hike in the hottest spot in the country during peak summer, but I've always had a thing for those kinds of extremes. Names Leo, Leo James, and I work in construction. Nothing fancy, just backhoes and concrete, but it keeps a man strong and gives him an appreciation for a bit of open space come vacation time. This trip would be a little different. I wasn't trekking some marked trail, oh no. I'd gotten this ranger buddy of mine to mark up a map with a secret route, the kind of tough scramble with gorgeous, desolate views known only to a few. It looked like pure hell, which was just the way I liked it. First day out, that California heat hit hard, but it was nothing a prepared guy like me couldn't handle. Second day, though, that's when things got weird. You wouldn't expect many folks in that part of the park, right? Remote doesn't even describe it. Cracked, baked earth, salt flats and canyons like raw scars cut in the rock. Yet, late afternoon, I came across a truck, an old pickup, rust-flecked and half-sunken into the sandy ground. Now my dad was a mechanic. He always preached caution. Leave what you don't understand alone, son, especially out where the sun'll fry your brains. But I couldn't just walk on by. The thing looked abandoned for months, years maybe. So I took a closer look. Big mistake. The interior was trashed, ripped seats, windows shattered, and there was this stain on the passenger seat, dark and spattered, dried blood. That was my first thought. My skin prickled and not from the sun this time. Then, from the edge of my vision, I saw it. Movement, up on a ridge. Something was up there, watching me. It was too far, 
too obscured by the haze for me to see it clearly, but the shape dot 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 IT didn't look right. Not an animal. More like a person, but lanky, too tall. That was enough. I bolted, heart pounding, putting distance between me and that truck. Found camp, tried to forget what I saw. Next morning, I woke up feeling watched. That same unease settled on me as when you know a predator has you in its sights. My footsteps felt heavy on the trail. I wanted to look back every minute, but Dad's voice echoed in my head. Don't let him see your fear. The rest of the day passed without any sightings, but it didn't bring relief. If anything, that dread got worse. Evening came and I stopped short. Up ahead, a good hundred yards, was a campfire. That wouldn't be strange on an ordinary trail. But out here, that meant someone else had found this little undiscovered path of mine. I crouched low in the brush, trying to decide what to do. Part of me, the cautious part, said, Abort, Leo. Pack up, backtrack, and get the hell out. But another part, the foolhardy part, the part that got me into these extreme trips to begin with. It said, Go on, see who it is. I approached slowly, keeping to cover. It was a small fire, just enough for one person. Whoever set up camp here, they weren't planning on staying long. Then I saw their gear. A beat-up pack, a sleeping bag unrolled directly on the ground, a couple of water jugs. It looked like someone was living out here, roughing it in the wild. That thought scared me more than a truck full of bloodstains. There are reasons you don't see folks setting up permanent in those parts. The desert can kill even an experienced hiker. So who was this? Some kind of survivalist nut? A fugitive? I started edging backward, ready to vanish back into the rocks, and I stepped on a dry twig. It snapped loud in the desert stillness. A voice rasped out, Who's there? I went very still. The voice sounded old, parched. I didn't answer. Come on out. I don't bite much anymore. Leastways, not hard. It tried to chuckle, but the sound was more like a dry cough. Slowly I emerged from the brush. There by the fire crouched an old man, if you could even call him a man. He was skin and bones, clad in tatters of sun-faded clothes. His hair and beard were long, matted, and his skin the same leathery texture as cured boot leather. But it was his eyes that got me. Black, sunken deep in their sockets, shining with a mad hunger. Lost, are you? He asked, his lips barely moving around the words. He gestured at my pack. Hiker, huh? Got food? I couldn't help it. I took a step back. That look in his eyes. It wasn't just desperation. It was something else. Something primal. That's when he stood up. And I understood why I'd thought the figure on the ridge looked wrong. He was tall. Impossibly tall for how bony he was. And his arms... God, his arms were too long ending in thick knotted fingers that twitched like spider legs. I lost it then, turned and ran, not even looking back. The man-thing didn't let out a yell behind me. He moved with a kind of unnatural speed those spindly limbs shouldn't have allowed, keeping low to the ground as he gave chase. I ran until my lungs burned, until rocks sliced up my hands, until my legs finally buckled beneath me. I skidded across a patch of gravel, gasping for breath. He was getting closer, closer enough that I could smell him. A sour, acrid stench like rotten meat left in the sun. I scrambled to my feet, kept going. But it was no use. He was loping alongside me now, just yards away. That mad glint in his eyes, his mouth stretched in a grotesque grin. Just when I thought he was going to leap, he stopped. Ahead, I saw why. The trail cut sharply off. Beyond, it was a sheer drop, a hundred feet at least, down to the canyon floor. He crouched by the edge, tilting his head and regarding me. And that's when it hit me. This wasn't a chase. He was hurting me. My survival instincts took over. He wanted me to jump? Fine. I wouldn't give him the satisfaction. 
I looked around desperately. There, up the hillside, a narrow fissure in the rock, barely wide enough for a man to pass. I sprinted toward it, ignoring the pain of my throbbing legs. The man-thing let out a weird, guttural cry, like an animal in frustration. But he didn't follow. I clawed my way up the fissure, squeezing and hauling myself inch by inch. Rocks came loose, tumbled down the slope towards him. He hissed, retreated back from the edge. Up, up, I climbed until the fissure spat me out at the edge of a plateau. I lay there, panting, heart pounding against my ribs. Didn't dare look back, just knew I had to keep moving. I staggered on, following the curve of the rocks, looking for another way down. I don't know how long I spent wandering. Time lost its meaning. Just thirst, blazing sun, and the ever-present awareness of being watched. I found water eventually, a fetid little seep in the rocks, but drinking it made me feel worse. Night fell, and it brought no relief. The man-thing's eyes seemed to burn in the darkness, twin pinpricks of malevolent light that followed my every move. I tried to find a hiding spot, but it was useless. He always knew where I was. By sunrise, I was delirious. I stumbled out onto a ledge, the desert stretching out before me, vast and empty, and there, on the edge of the precipice, he waited, crouched, ready, as if the whole thing had been an elaborate hunt leading to this moment. Something in me snapped. I wasn't going to die cowering. I charged forward, yelling, a primal scream that split the dry air. The impact took me clean off my feet. We tumbled together, him clawing at me, a flurry of limbs and dust, and then... open air. There was no time for fear, just a sense of falling, the sun-scorched earth rushing up to meet me. They found my body two weeks later, Search and rescue team, guided to the spot by my ranger buddy, who got worried when I didn't make a scheduled check-in. The official cause of death was the fall, of course. Broken neck, multiple fractures, the works. The weirdness was the state of the remains. Torn and shredded, as if some big animal got at it. And my face. They said it was frozen in a mask of terror, which was pretty accurate if you ask me. They never found the truck, never found the old man thing either. That part of Death Valley, it still has its secrets, places where maps are blank. I'd learned that the hard way. And somewhere out there, maybe it's still waiting. The desert folk, locals who've seen a thing or two, tell stories of a creature, a scavenger haunting the wastes, a tall, gaunt thing with insatiable hunger and eyes that glow in the dark. They don't give it a name, just whispers and sideways glances. They don't need to. I saw it, and I know. It was 1978, my last year of college, and I was desperate for a taste of the real world before settling into some boring desk job. A buddy of mine, Rowan, convinced me to take a road trip. We called ourselves explorers, but really, we were just a couple of broke kids looking for adventure. My name's Wyatt, by the way. Arizona called to us. Some grand idea about old cowboy towns and desert mystique. We packed up my beat-up Camaro and hit the open road, the freedom intoxicating. By the time we reached Sedona, we were ready for a break from the cramped car. The stunning red rock formations and the laid-back vibe of the town felt just about perfect. Plus, we'd heard there were some less-traveled hiking trails out past Slide Rock State Park. That's how we found ourselves on the Oak Creek Canyon Trail, backpacks loaded and ready to disappear into nature for a few days. That first afternoon was everything you'd want in an Arizona hike. Sun-washed trails, the smell of pinyon pines, and the distant burbling of the creek below. Rowan was his usual goofy self, slinging bad jokes and pointing out silly cloud shapes. He always did bring out the lighter side of me. As the daylight began to fade, we set up camp in a secluded clearing. 
The air was still warm, with just the slightest hint of an autumn chill. We built a small campfire, just enough to roast our dinner and keep us warm into the night. Somewhere in the trees, an owl hooted, that mournful, lonely sound that echoes so clearly in the wilderness. That night, I had the strangest dream. It was about a woman, her features blurry and indistinct, but her eyes burning with an unsettling intensity. She stood before this gnarled, twisted old tree, and her voice whispered a warning over and over, just two words. Keep away. Woke up in a cold sweat, heart pounding the campfire down to dying embers. Couldn't shake the feeling that some unseen gaze was on me. Whoa, you look rough, Rowan said when I finally stumbled out of my tent the next morning. I blamed it on a lousy night's sleep and bad campfire food. But deep down, I was spooked. That dream and the eerie feeling, it was putting me on edge. We decided to keep to Oak Creek Trail but pushed further up towards the canyon. As we climbed higher, the vegetation changed. The scrub bushes gave way to towering pines, and the sun seemed to filter through the branches in hazy rays. Something felt off about this place, though I couldn't pinpoint what. We came across a section of the trail that had been partially washed out. It must have been a recent storm. Just beyond it, I spotted it. An old, gnarled juniper tree, its form oddly twisted, almost like a clawed hand reaching for the sky. It was the tree from my dream. My heart skipped a beat. That woman's warning echoing in my ears. Keep away. Hey, isn't that a bit off trail? Think we should skirt around? Rowan asked, his face creased with uncertainty. Nah, come on, adventurer. Let's just get a closer look, I said, pushing down the unease. That rational side of me kicked in. It's just a tree, dude. My feet seem to have a mind of their own, pushing me forward towards that creepy tree. As I drew closer, I almost tripped over a tangle of exposed roots. Tucked beneath them was something half buried in the dirt, a tattered piece of fabric. When I pulled it out, I felt a chill down my spine. It was a woman's scarf, old and faded, the design intricate but somehow unsettling. That's when we heard it. A snapping sound, like a twig breaking, followed by a low, guttural growl. Rowan let out a curse that would have made our mothers proud. From the undergrowth, he emerged. The biggest man I've ever seen. Had to be at least seven feet tall, wild, matted hair hanging past his shoulders, his eyes blazing in a face obscured by a thick, filthy beard. His clothes were rags, his skin covered in scratches and old scars. He bared his teeth, yellow and jagged in an inhuman snarl. Food! He lunged at us, the word echoing in the stillness. Rowan grabbed a rock, yelling for me to run. I don't remember the next few minutes clearly. It was all instinct, scrambling back the way we came, crashing through bushes, my heart a drumbeat trying to drown out the creature's roars behind me. Rowan, I don't know what happened to him. I never saw him again. Back on the trail, I ran until I literally couldn't anymore, collapsing at the side of the path. I staggered into town days later, half mad with fear and thirst. Local authorities organized a search, focusing on Slide Rock State Park and the Oak Creek Canyon area, but found no trace of Rowan or that thing. Newspapers ran a small story, hiker missing in Red Rock Country, and soon the incident was forgotten by everyone except me. I couldn't stay in Arizona after that. Packed up and left, never to return. Sometimes in those restless half-sleep moments, I see that woman's eyes again. Did she try to warn me? Was there something more sinister out there in those canyons? Or was it all just the shattered fragments of a nightmare that refuses to fade, forever lodged in my memory like a splinter in my mind? It was early 1988 when I went on that trek through the Green Mountains of Vermont. 
You know how people say they go into the woods for some peace and solitude? Well, I guess I'm not one of those people. I like the mountains, sure, but really I just need an excuse to be away from the city, the traffic, the noise. Makes me feel more human somehow. I always head up to Killington Peak. It's a tough climb, but the view is worth it. This time, though, I wanted something more challenging. I dug up an old trail guide and found a route marked Experienced Hikers Only. Seemed like a good way to make a long weekend interesting, so I packed my gear and headed north. The first day was just like any other hike. Hard work, beautiful scenery, zero people. Just the way I like it. Found a sheltered little clearing near a stream, made camp, ate a simple dinner, and crawled into my sleeping bag early the first night. Hiking solo like that, there isn't much to do after sundown. When I woke up on the second day, something felt off. No birds, no rustling of squirrels in the brush, just silence. It was unnerving, but I brushed it off. Weather can change fast in the mountains. I had breakfast, broke camp, and got back on the trail. That's when the real trouble started. About an hour into my hike, something crashed through the trees off to my left. It sounded huge, and I froze, my heart pounding. Whatever it was, it didn't come out onto the trail, so after a few tense moments, I cautiously pushed onward. I tried to convince myself it was just a bear or a moose, but I'd never heard anything move with that much force. The rest of the morning was filled with an uneasy tension. I kept seeing movement out of the corner of my eye, always disappearing before I got a good look. Then, the footprints started. They were massive, bigger than any human could make, and misshapen, as if something had been walking on mangled feet. The trail was winding its way up a steep ridge, and I knew I couldn't stick to it anymore. The trees were thicker on either side of the path, offering better cover, so I veered off. Problem was, the trail guide was now useless. I was navigating by instinct, hoping I could loop back eventually. That afternoon, I heard what sounded like an animal in pain. A low, groaning howl echoed through the trees, followed by wet, ripping noises. I wanted more than anything to turn and run, but what I saw froze me in place. Standing on a boulder less than 50 yards away was the largest, ugliest creature I've ever seen in my life. It looked vaguely human, maybe seven feet tall, but hunched over and covered in coarse, filthy hair. Its limbs were too long, its hands almost dragging along the ground, and its face. It was like some twisted caricature of a man with a jutting jaw and eyes that shone an unnatural yellow in the dim forest light. I was certain it hadn't seen me yet, so I slowly lowered myself to the ground, trying to become one with the undergrowth. That's when it turned its head towards me. For a heartbeat, those grotesque yellow eyes locked with mine, and a primal wave of terror crashed over me. Somehow, I knew in that instant this thing was more than just a mutated animal. There was a cruel intelligence behind its gaze. I scrambled to my feet and ran. I didn't care about the trail. Didn't care if I even knew where I was going. The sounds of it crashing through the woods behind me spurred me on, and I ran like my life depended on it. Because it did. That night, I hid in a tiny cave I'd stumbled across, too terrified to sleep. The thing kept circling in the darkness, sometimes growling, sometimes scratching at the rocks, but it never came inside. Just before dawn, the sounds finally ceased, and I drifted into a fitful, fear-filled sleep. The next morning, I was battered and exhausted, but alive. My first thought was getting out of those woods. With no trail to follow, I just picked a direction and moved, trying to ignore my trembling muscles and gnawing hunger. Then, Late in the afternoon, the trees broke and I emerged onto a dirt road. Relief flooded over me. I had made it until I saw the cruiser parked at the end of the road, its lights flashing. 
That's when I knew something was horribly wrong. Two officers stepped out as I approached. They were grim-faced, and their eyes kept flicking over my shoulder as if expecting something to follow me out of the woods. That was when they told me. Told me about the missing hikers. The reports of something inhuman in those hills. The mangled corpses they'd found. I told them everything I knew, trying to describe the creature I'd seen. Their expressions never changed, but there was a flicker of something in their eyes. Recognition, maybe? It was almost as unsettling as the thing in the woods itself. They didn't press for many details, they just seemed relieved I was alive. I hitched a ride to the nearest town, then home. It's months later now, and I still see that thing when I close my eyes, still feel the terror of that desperate run through the trees. Every creak of my apartment floor makes me jump, makes me wonder if somehow it followed me back. They never caught up with it, whatever it was, and the disappearances in those mountains stopped after I escaped. Some folks called me a hero, said I'd saved others from that thing. They don't know the truth. I'm not a hero. I'm just the one who got away. And that creature, whatever it might be, it's still out there. I have only to look at the scars on my legs from my frantic flight to know that it's real. The Green Mountains haven't seen the last of me. I have unfinished business there, and as scared as I am, I have to try and find it. The year was 1983, and I was finally exploring the Gila Wilderness in New Mexico. I'd always been drawn to the desert, the starkness of it, that harsh beauty that either draws you in or repels you. And Gila, with its deep canyons and rugged peaks, is a hiker's paradise, if you know what you're doing. I sure did. Or that's what I thought. Folks call me Finn. City life never agreed with me, but out here, alone with my pack and a topo map, well, that's where I feel at home. The first few days were perfect. Scorching sun followed by those ink-black desert nights, the stars like diamonds spilled across the sky. If there was paradise, this was it. Day four is when things went sideways. I'd planned a long loop hike through a canyon system, figured I'd refill my water at a creek halfway and then camp near the head of the canyon. Trouble is, the creek was dried up, bone dry, not even a trickle. Now, I wasn't completely reckless. There were supposed to be a few natural springs further up the canyon, smaller, less reliable, but still marked on the map. That decision, the one to push on and hope I'd find water, that was my first mistake. But hey, I'm stubborn, so off I went. By mid-afternoon, I was getting seriously dehydrated. My head ached, my mouth tasted like sand, and every step on the loose canyon rock was an effort. Then, I stumbled on a set of footprints. Not boot prints, barefoot, human, or something that was a close imitation. For a minute, I got a strange, hopeful feeling. Maybe there were locals who knew of a hidden water source, or even another hiker who'd brought extra supplies. My shouts echoed uselessly off the canyon walls. Whoever made those tracks was long gone. I took off after them. Logically, it made no sense. I had no way of knowing if they were going towards a water source or even if they were fresh. Desperation's not exactly known for its rationality. The sun was starting to dip lower in the sky, casting fantastical shadows on the canyon walls when I spotted the person who made those footprints. Up ahead, a figure stood on a ledge, silhouetted against the blazing orange sunset. Too far to see clearly, but tall, even lanky, and definitely no hiker. They were moving in a way that sent a shiver down my spine. Not human, more like... Like an oversized spider scuttling along the rocks. A chill ran through me that had nothing to do with the dipping temperature. That was when I knew... Whatever this thing was, it wasn't friendly. My first instinct was to run, but the canyon here was narrow, 
sheer walls on either side. Nowhere to go but forward or back, and there was no way I was turning around after coming this far. I crouched behind a boulder, trying to think, trying to form a plan. The figure disappeared from view. Had it spotted me? Or was it just continuing its odd, loping gait? I considered leaving the canyon floor, picking my way up the steep slope, but that would make me completely exposed. The choice was made for me. A shower of gravel rained down from the ledge above me, accompanied by a chittering noise, half bird, half insect, that raised the hair on my neck. I risked a peek around the boulder and saw it, the creature clinging to the rock face about twenty feet above. Its body looked humanish, if a human was stretched out to twice its length, with limbs too long, too thin. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, and on its face. Well, let's just say your average friendly neighborhood squirrel has more human-like features than whatever was perched above me. It cocked its head, staring down with glistening black eyes that gave nothing away. Panic clawed at my throat. I didn't carry a gun, never thought I'd need one out here, but my pack held a good-sized hunting knife. Not much against whatever this thing was, but it was better than nothing. There was a flash of movement from above, too fast to track, before the creature was on the ground right in front of me. My brain barely had time to register the impossible speed before it lunged, I barely managed to block the first blow with my pack, the force sending me stumbling back. The thing snapped at my exposed arm with needle-like teeth, its skin rippling strangely with the effort. I swung wildly with my knife, more out of desperation than strategy. It shrieked, a piercing sound that hurt my ears, and scuttled back, holding up a clawed hand. Greenish fluid dripped from a gash on its palm and its eyes burned with fury. I scrambled to my feet. We circled each other, me desperately trying to create some distance, the creature hissing and watching my every move, trying to decide when to strike again. Then, the ground gave way under my feet. The fall didn't last long, more of a tumble into a sandy hollow. Pain exploded in my ankle as I landed and I swore, knowing I'd sprained it badly, maybe even worse. Before I could get my bearings, the creature was on me. It moved like a blur, its elongated limbs snatching at me, its teeth snapping inches from my face. I lashed out with my knife, more out of blind instinct than anything else, and felt it connect solidly. The creature shrieked again, this time pulling back and cradling a wounded arm. For a moment there was just the harsh sound of our ragged breathing, the stench of its greenish blood heavy in the air. The wound on its arm was already starting to close, the skin writhing and knitting back together with disturbing speed. I'd slowed it down, but not by much. My ankle throbbed in protest. I couldn't run. Yet somehow I knew I wasn't about to become a meal for whatever this thing was. I had one last trick, a Hail Mary of desperation. Years ago, after a particularly nasty encounter with a pissed-off raccoon, I'd picked up a can of extra-strength pepper spray, the kind used for bears, not just angry suburban trash pandas. It was buried somewhere deep in my pack. The creature was stalking towards me, slow, deliberate, like it was savoring the moment before the kill. Every second counted. I yanked my pack open with shaking hands, the world narrowing to the rough fabric and the metallic clink of the pepper spray canister. It lunged just as I ripped the spray free. I had time for a single shot, aimed right into those horrifying black eyes. The spray hissed into the air, and the creature shrieked like a wounded cat, clawing at its face and staggering backwards. I didn't wait to see if it would recover. Scrambling to my feet, I hobbled back into the canyon. Didn't matter where I went as long as it was away from that thing. The sun was long gone, the canyon shrouded in near darkness. Stumbling, falling, crawling sometimes, I pushed myself on. Behind me, I heard the creature's angry howls, growing fainter as I put distance between us. My ankle was on fire, my lungs burned, my water bottle was dry hours ago. 
Yet, I moved forward, driven by blind, animal terror. Finally, I collapsed on the canyon floor, too exhausted to even look up. I lay there, gasping for air, listening to my own ragged breaths and the eerie silence of the desert night. They found me the next day. I was semi-delirious, ranting about monsters and spindly creatures that defied logic. The EMTs got me stabilized, and a chopper eventually flew me out of there to the nearest hospital. The official story was simple. Experienced hiker got lost, dehydrated, and took a nasty fall. They put me in a cast and sent me home after a couple of days. I'm not sure if I could have convinced any doctor otherwise, even if I'd wanted to. No way on earth was I talking about those... things in the canyon. I never went back to Gila, not to that corner of it anyway. My ankle healed, though it's still prone to aching after a long day on the trail. I still hike, though less remote trails now. I like knowing there are other folks around, just in case. The desert draws you back, even after you've seen its dark heart. But that primal fear never quite leaves. It sits in the back of my mind, lurking just below the surface. The news reports pop up every few years. Missing hiker, body never recovered. I know the truth others won't accept. Those things I saw. Call them Wendigo, Rake, Skinwalker. Whatever label makes them easier to dismiss, I know they're out there. Survivors. We don't get a club or a support group. We get doubt, condescending looks and dismissive shrugs from those who never saw the darkness up close. Sometimes, late at night, I look at the scars on my arm, the teeth marks I bear like a grim trophy. I try to convince myself it was a dream, a delusion, an ugly hallucination brought on by the relentless desert sun. But it doesn't matter if I convince myself or not. The creatures in the Kila wilderness know the truth. I was their prey. And by some miracle, I managed to walk away. For now. This happened to me on February 8, 1993. My name's Doug Ellis, and I've been a deputy in the town of Pine Creek, Montana, for almost 10 years. Married, got two kids, Becky and little Tommy, cute as buttons they are. Before Pine Creek, I served in the Marines. Maybe that's why I was drawn to law enforcement, or maybe that's why when everything went to hell, well, you'll see. It all started with the cattle disappearances, a few head missing here and there, nothing too alarming at first. Ranchers chalked it up to coyotes or a mountain lion that had strayed down from the higher elevations. But then the carcasses started turning up, half-eaten, some torn apart in ways no normal predator would do, and always drained of blood, like something out of a Dracula movie. Ranchers started getting spooked. The whispers began, mostly jokingly, about werewolves or Bigfoot gone rogue. I laughed along, but deep down, a cold feeling started worming its way into my gut. Then old man Tucker vanished. Tucker lived way out in the boonies, the kind of stubborn old coot who refused to use a cell phone and liked to brag that he hadn't been to a doctor since the Korean War. When his daughter reported him missing after a few days of not being able to reach him, I figured we'd find him holed up in his cabin drunk on moonshine and passed out in front of the TV. We found the cabin all right. The door was splintered inward like a bear had busted through it, and inside was a horror scene. The furniture was smashed to pieces, blood was splattered across the walls, the floor, even the ceiling. The whole place reeked of something rotten, like a butcher shop left out in the summer sun. No sign of Tucker just a single, massive, clawed footprint pressed into the blood-soaked wood floor. Word got out, and the whole town went into a tailspin. Folks started double-bolting their doors, arming themselves like they were expecting an invasion. Sheriff Thompson sent in a request for wildlife specialists. He figured maybe we were dealing with some kind of mutated bear, something environmental toxins had driven mad. A plausible theory 
if it weren't for the nagging details that didn't fit. The wildlife guys came and went. Their thermal imaging trap stayed up for a week, catching nothing but the usual critters. They left shaking their heads, muttering about how they couldn't explain what had happened over at Tucker's place. I started keeping a sawed-off shotgun by my bed, and the nightmares began. A few nights later, I was on patrol along a lonely back road that skirted the base of the mountains. It was close to midnight, snow coming down heavy, the kind of night where anything could be lurking in the white shadows. My radio crackled, and I tensed, thinking it was another report of a missing pet or a spooky noise some anxious resident thought was a monster. Instead, it was Becky Thompson, the sheriff's daughter, and her usual crew of troublemakers out for a joyride, their voices slurred and laughter echoing too loudly over the static. Those idiots, I muttered to myself, checking the rearview mirror. Sure enough, I saw headlights weaving erratically behind me. I pulled over, intending to read those kids the riot act, and maybe even haul one of them to the station to sober up. But as the headlights got closer, something felt off. The car, an old, beat-up Chevy, was weaving too much, and it seemed to be going way too fast on the icy road. That's when I saw it. A hulking shape leaped out of the darkness and landed on the hood of the car. It was enormous, bigger than any bear, silhouetted against the swirling snow and headlights. The car swerved, trying to shake whatever it was off, then skidded completely off the road and plowed into a snowdrift. Instincts honed from the Marines and years on the force took over. I grabbed my shotgun, threw the cruiser into park and charged toward the Chevy. I could hear screaming, high-pitched and terrified, cut short by the sound of shattering glass and the guttural snarl of the thing. I reached the car, its headlights still blazing into the snowy darkness. The windows were smashed, and the inside was splattered with blood. Becky and one of the boys were gone, dragged out through the broken glass. Of the other two, there wasn't much left to find. And then I turned and saw it, crouched amidst the snow flurries, a monstrous form vaguely familiar yet horrifyingly inhuman all at once. It was at least eight feet tall when it reared up on its hind legs, covered in coarse, matted fur. Its face was stretched and elongated, all teeth and predatory eyes that glowed a sickening yellow. That's when it let loose a blood-chilling howl, a sound that ripped through the night air and sent a primal surge of terror coursing through my veins. I aimed the shotgun and fired, the blast echoing through the night. It roared in pain, a hot spray of blood splattering the snow. Somehow I kept firing, each shot punctuated by its bone-shaking growls. I don't know how many times I pulled the trigger, only that my shotgun finally clicked empty. Wounded, the creature lunged. I barely had time to brace myself before it slammed into me, sending both of us tumbling into the snow. I felt claws rake across my chest, tearing through my jacket and a hot, foul breath wash over my face. Somehow I managed to roll, the snow cushioning my fall but also sending a blinding spray of ice into my eyes. I scrambled to my feet, fumbling for the spare shells in my pocket. The thing was circling me, growling low, its monstrous form moving with terrifying agility despite its injuries. The snow was falling too hard, visibility was crap, and my hands were shaking from the adrenaline and the numbing cold. Then, through the swirling storm, I saw another set of headlights approaching along the lonely road. Salvation. At least that's what I hoped. I raised one hand and waved frantically, my other hand clutching the shotgun and hastily reloading. The car skidded to a stop, the driver's door flung open, and Sheriff Thompson emerged, his expression unreadable. He took in the scene, the wrecked Chevy, the blood staining the snow, and me, disheveled and wild-eyed, standing in the middle of it all. Alice, he shouted, his voice a mix of authority and concern. What in God's name? Behind him, a couple more deputies piled out of the car, their guns drawn, scanning the snowy darkness for the threat. That's when the creature chose to strike. 
it burst from the veil of snow, charging straight towards the unwitting deputies. There was a flurry of shouts, panicked gunfire, and the echoing roar of the creature in pain. Through the chaos, I caught glimpses of the deputies scrambling back towards the car, trying to escape the beast's relentless attack. Thompson, though, he stood his ground. Using the car door as makeshift cover, he emptied his revolver at the creature. The bullets seemed to have little effect, merely enraging it further. It swatted aside one deputy like a rag doll, then lunged for Thompson, jaws gaping wide. I couldn't just stand there. Reloaded shotgun in hand, I sprinted through the snow towards the sheriff, towards the monstrous form locked in a deadly embrace with him. With a desperate surge of strength, I slammed the stock of my shotgun into the side of the creature's head. It snarled and whipped around, releasing its grip on Thompson and turning its fury on me. I fired point-blank, blasting a hole in its side, the impact momentarily staggering the monstrous thing. It screeched in agony, thrashing and clawing at the air. The other deputies, having scrambled back to their feet, added their gunfire to mine. Still, the creature raged, its strength fueled by a terrifying, unnatural fury. It took a dozen, maybe more shots to finally bring it down. There was a final, shuddering heave of its massive body, then it slumped to the ground, its unnatural yellow eyes fading to a dull, lifeless gray. Silence descended, broken only by our harsh panting and the soft hiss of falling snow. Thompson pushed himself to his feet, a streak of blood dripping down his forehead. The deputies cautiously approached the creature's body, guns still trained on its massive form, ensuring it wasn't playing dead. What the hell? was all Thompson could manage, his voice filled with a mixture of shock and a weary grimness. He looked at me, some unspoken understanding passing between us. The aftermath was a whirlwind of disbelief, frantic cover-ups and whispered tales that twisted and expanded with each retelling. The official story was a rabid bear, a freak occurrence driven mad by some unknown toxin. The mutilated bodies in the Chevy, well, they conveniently blamed that on a high-speed collision with a deer, the wild animal story, a plausible explanation for the carnage. The creature, what was left of it, vanished into some government lab, never to be seen again by the eyes of the public. Folks who asked too many questions quickly found themselves the target of disapproving glances and hushed whispers. Pine Creek quieted down, the terror receding into the shadows, life returning to a semblance of normalcy. But some of us, Thompson, the few deputies who faced the creature that night, and me, we know the truth. We formed a silent, unofficial brotherhood, bound by experience none outside our circle could ever understand. Sometimes late at night, I still jolt awake in a cold sweat, the memory of those glowing yellow eyes and the creature's fetid breath seared into my mind. I checked the lock on Becky's bedroom door twice, the sight of her sleeping peacefully my only salvation from the terrors lurking in my memory. I still patrol those lonely mountain roads, and on snowy nights, I sometimes imagine the crunch of tires on fresh snow, the distant sound of terrified screams carried on the whistling wind. My hand tightens on the shotgun by my side, ever present, ever ready. You see, the thing about monsters, the truly horrifying ones, is not just their claws and their teeth. It's the knowledge that they exist, lurking on the fringes of our understanding. It's the knowledge that there might be more out there, unseen and waiting. And it's the silent, unspoken question that echoes in the stillness of those Montana nights. What if it comes back?